Now, you're very welcome back. So we are delighted, I have to say, that Tony Cascarino has joined us in studio. He's over in Dublin because he is uh, promoting a new sports documentary. It is called Cascarino Voices, all part of the new Sharp Shorts uh, series on Virgin. So six short films commissioned by Virgin Media Television in partnership with Screen Ireland. And it is available to watch now for free on the Virgin Media Player. So do go and check it out. Tony Cascarino, a uh, warm welcome. Great to have you in our studio. It's lovely to have you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, pleasure to be here. I haven't been here for, uh, in Dublin for about four years. So, uh, yeah, a really lot, good. A lot of us haven't done things. <laughs> we used to do a lot for a couple of years, I suppose. Uh, not that anyone needs reminding. 14-year uh, career with Ireland, 88 caps, Euro 88, Italia 90, USA 94. Over 600 club appearances, Gillingham, 81 to 87, Millwall, 87 to 90, Villa for a season, Celtic for a season, Chelsea for two years, 92 to 94, and then the great Indian summer in France at Marseille and uh, Nancy. Oldest player in Ligue 1 to score a hat-trick, I saw today, <laughs> 37, hanging in there. Uh, retired in 2000 and you have forged... Um, well, a brilliantly long career in the media, Talk Sport and The Times for 20 plus years. So uh, not bad for the hairdresser from South East <laughs> London, eh? That'll do. Yeah, I, when you, you read them, you know, them, all that information out there, you, I sort of scratch my head because I, I've now been in the media longer than, I play, longer than I played football. So that feels quite weird. But I loved it. Look, I loved every minute of it. Yeah. What's more ruthless, media or football? Um... <laughs> I think you could probably put them in the same box. Um, sport has to be ruthless uh, because you have to get... Uh, if to get to the very top, there's a lot of tough decisions by a number of people. And um, I've realised that towards the end of my career that, you know, if you do... Uh, there's standards at certain football clubs. So if you say Man United, Liverpool, all the, you know, the big clubs that have achieved a lot, OK is not good enough. And that's when you read out there earlier, you, you touched on Celtic a year, Aston Villa a year, Chelsea two, it was nearly three, but it was two and a half years. And the reason why I didn't stay at Celtic and uh, obviously Aston Villa was that big clubs um, didn't play well enough, done OK. OK is not a standard. And that's when it gets bru brutal and it gets ruthless. And then you get the media involved who can add, add more spice to it. And look... I I never reacted too much to it because I take it on board. I never would get in a, a, a an argument with a journalist. I would just go, do you know what? I can only prove a point by when I cross the white line, mm. like I have to to a manager. I was uh, reading about your nickname, seeing as you mentioned it at Aston Villa. Go on. Ted. Oh, Ted, yes. Oh, God, no. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to tell the story of Go Ted? on, then. I, I thought it, I, it, it sums up the uh, cruelty, but also the funniness of her dressing. Yeah, well, um, I, was at, um, I was at Millwall with Teddy Sheringham, and I always was sort of, you know, I played a little bit of a second fiddle role, and he'd always seem to outdo me. And then for the first time in my career, I, I get a move to Aston Villa uh, before Ted. Teddy Sheringham stayed at uh, Millwall. And I went to Villa. Yeah. So I was the first one gone. It's the big time. Yeah, the big time. So I go to Villa and I didn't score for the first three or four games and Paul McGrath's there and and I, and I room report that time and I, I can't seem to get a goal. And in training, everyone keeps calling me Ted. So I let it go because you don't react to a nickname. When you get given one, the worst thing you could do is react to, why am I called Ted? Yeah. So anyway, I, it goes on for about three or four games. Then I get to sixth game and I'm saying to McGrath, Paul, tell me why they keep calling me Ted. And he goes, oh, no, I'm not telling you, big man. And Paul is, you know, he's not, he doesn't give you big long words out there or big long reasons. He's just, you know, short and sharp, Paul. And um, anyway, I get to about the seventh game and the week leading up to the to the match against Norwich, I've said to Paul, Paul, please tell me why they keep calling me Ted. It's driving me great. He went, well, big man, we think we signed the wrong one. We wanted Teddy Sheringham. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed. And it was the first time I scored. And, of course, after I scored, I went, Ted's arrived. <laughs> uh, yeah. What was going on in that period? Because um, at Celtic, you uh, tell the story, and it's in the um, short feature as well, about mm. Celtic fan abusing you, so it didn't go well there. And then I think on your debut at Chelsea, you were booed mm. as well. On my debut, yeah. 
I mean, that's a hell of a welcome. I scored as well. Oh, did you? I got man in the match in the papers the next day for Chelsea. I was booed on my debut. Right. What was going on in your career at that stage? Just um, uh, I had some personal issues, um, which weren't particularly good. It was just after um, sort of the World Cup of '90. Um, it, I, I was I was in a bit of a strange place, and I wasn't fit as I should have been. Um, I joined Celtic and Liam Brady was one of my heroes and still is today. He was the manager and I, I've always, I apologised to Liam um, when I was there. I said, look, you haven't got the guy you know and we had a number of meetings and, you know, we, we chatted a lot and it just didn't work out. And then, of course, I, I got that episode of a fan coming up to me in the middle of an high street, giving me stick and I just literally saying, well, look, look you know, a Rangers fan, you, you know, you just, why are you vetting it at me? And he went, no, I'm not, I'm a Celtic fan. I knew he was. Mm. And from that moment, I sort of felt, well, I don't want to, I don't want to be, you know, quitting and thinking he's a loser. And I've said this to many people. I said, look, it's not the big club, and he can't play for Celtic because he's not good enough. He can't stand the. I said I played in front of Millwall fans. Millwall fans were as brutal as they come. I had one of my most successful periods at that time. So it was a difficult thing to take. But with all the things in, and I'm not making excuses because sure. I was. Not good. Yeah. I played my worst football by a country mile at Celtic. Yeah. But look, if your personal life isn't in good shape, I can imagine it's very, very difficult to translate a feel-good energy to your football. Yeah, I, look, I, I don't know for whatever reason. It just... The, the club... Celtic, when I joined, and, and I think Liam suffered to this for a little bit, it wasn't a particularly good dressing room. There was a lot of divide in there, and I felt it as soon as I got there. And I knew Chrissy Morris and mm. Packy Bonner from playing for Republic of Ireland with them. Um, but it just didn't quite feel the same. And then when you play badly and, and the divide is shown, you, you just feel... I just knew I had to go. Yeah. I knew I had to go. Yeah. And France was just this uh, wonderful gift, I suppose. I, I was struck uh, listening to you uh, talk elsewhere, and you were saying that... Um, around the time Marseille played Juventus and you scored a nice goal and Juventus were like, hang on, who is this guy? And they were checking what age you were with the view maybe to... Uh, I scored signing. two in that game. Did you score two? Okay. And the guy, Kola, who played for Germany, I think it's, is it Jan Kola? Yeah. Um, he marked me and I played against him with Republic of Ireland. We won 2-0 two, two in Germany uh, in a friendly just prior to the, what was it? it would have been the 90 World Cup. Um no, not 90 World Cup. I, I played against him. It must have been later. It must have been later. But I played against him. He played for Juve as a centre-half. Yeah. And he said, you're not the same player I played against six months ago. You know. Yeah, uh, because you were 15. So I tell you what year yeah. it was. I joined Marseille in 94. It was, ni it was 93. It was mm. before the World Cup in America. Okay. Yeah. So you were fit and you were being a professional almost in the truest sense of the word, maybe for the first time in France. That was part of the story. Yeah, look, big centre-forwards can look cumbersome, awkward. If you're not in your best condition, I played in Marseille. I was 13 stone six. In, I never got below 14 stone in England. I was eight pound lighter. It made a massive difference to me. And I was a bit of a, a jack the lad. Um, you know, didn't if the lads were going out, especially at Chelsea at that particular time, if they were going out, I would go with them. And, and I, I put on weight quite easily. Right. You know, I just did, you know. I remember going on a holiday with uh, Millwall and I was with uh, I room with Sheridan and Sherid Sheridan's got not even an ounce of fat on him at any time wherever he eats. Still, and I I decided that week in Lanzarote I'm going to eat and drink exactly the same as Ted because we're rooming together. Okay. I did. He lost two pound. I put on six. Okay. <laughs> this is the truth. Honestly, I was like, how, how does this work? I literally followed him everything he ate, and we went out drinking. We had the same to drink. We didn't I just literally I said I'm going to follow you the whole week. Okay. And, uh, and I put on six pounds. How did he keep going till his 40s? 42. He's, he was, his dad was exactly the same. His metabolism was... He had um, an overactive thyroid. Now, if you're underactive, you can put on weight. Yes, okay. He had an overactive, which is dangerous in itself, but um, Ted just burnt calories and, you know, did it regularly. And I... You know, if you look at him now, he's Ted's, what, 55, something like that? Um, 54. And he hasn't got an ounce of fat on him. Yeah. I would imagine he is a dream... To play with the intelligence and the craft and yeah, yeah he was yeah brilliant yeah. that partnership was a great one yeah oh tremendous I was lucky I had some great partners from Frank Stapleton John Aldridge um, young Robbie Keane Noel Quinn and then you go to Clive Allen certainly I mean Kerry Dixon I was Kerry was at the end of his career you know but some great strikers and uh, Teddy was up there I mean 
I always said, I asked her at dinner, like, what would you compliment Teddy Sheridan for the most? What do you think? You played alongside him. What was his biggest attribute? I said, just look, everywhere he played and who he played with, they all played well. He's the perfect partner because he could play well with Andy Cole, he could play well with Dwight York, Alan Shearer, Les Ferdinand, yeah. Tony Cascarino. He could play well with everybody. That was his biggest asset for me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're talking, geez, time flies. Uh, Jack is dead three years in July. I presume you did see the documentary. You're good friends with Andy Townsend. Yes, yeah. Finding Jack. Yeah. Yes, OK, yeah. and Gabriel Clark involved with that. Uh, was that a, a good, because we all thought it was great, uh, mm. looking from afar, that bit more afar than you, was that a good encapsulation of the man you knew? Did you did you feel yeah. it? Yeah, caught him? Yeah, it was, it was Jack, because he could be funny, he could be quiet, he could be ruthless in his ways at times. Um, yeah, I thought they depicted Jack brilliantly. I think that was a standout feature. And all the players who played under Jack said the same thing. Right. He got Jack. I mean, he didn't he, he didn't particularly like being around players too much. He was quite, well, I don't want to be around you lot this week. You know, so we come over to Ireland and we'd train and Jack would go fishing and then reappear and on the fishing trip he'd tell John Aldridge the team. So we always knew the team before yeah. Jack had told us because John had told the rest of the team. <laughs> you know, Jack had some really strange ways. I never quite knew if Jack deliberately did it as to say things yes. to other people that they would feed it to us. So he wouldn't... Because he was he was incredibly sensitive at times, Jack. Yeah, and, well, I thought the, the moment that has stayed with, I think, people a couple of years on from that documentary now is when he... In his uh, elder years, when his health isn't good, he recognises Paul McGrath yeah. on the laptop is just all kinds of beautiful and poignant. But um, even when Paul is talking and he's going through a difficult time and Jack, I think, put his arm on him in the bedroom and said, I'm sorry, son, I didn't know you had it so mm. bad. Um, he tucked him in. Yeah, yeah, which is... You know, it's, a, it's at odds with the gruffness, but it was such a real part of who he was. It was lovely. Yeah, and um, look... I've said about Jack that that Paul could have been chucked out of the Ireland squad numerous times. Um, Jack supported him. The team supported Paul. Um, and Paul knows that. Paul Paul's a very quiet man. And Jack saw the problem guy, young man. He saw it all through Paul. Yeah. And I think he was incredibly sensitive to anything with Paul and knew that... One thing he couldn't do is discard him because he felt, if I discard Paul, I'm not sure what Paul would do. Mm. And I think that always sat with Jack, that I've got to, whatever he does, if it's as bad, I'll support him until I can't. Mm. Um, but he, he, and I thought he, he depicted Jack in that manner. And I've, I've seen it Jack over Jack, um, I've seen Jack over Bobby uh, be like that. You know, about, I remember us laughing. We were, you know, we were in, there was four of us in a, playing cards in a room and Jack walks in and there's a guy with a sweep over on there in the, in the TV, like, like Bobby had. And we were laughing and saying, oh, he's got oh, he's got a wig and like Joe. Jack went ballistic. Right. He went, you lot, you, you make me sick. He said, oh, Bobby, he said, I had to suffer that for years about having a sweep over and you're laughing. And we was all like literally silent because we didn't want to react because... I never thought Jack would be like that. And it was, okay, it's it's one of them things we all do at times where we just, we mock something that we, sure. you know, uh, and it, and I just, I would never saw him like it. And yet he would be sensitive to to many, many scenarios. That's very interesting. Uh, the Lean ba Brady documentary was out recently. I know you haven't seen it, but I was just going to play you a clip because it ties into that point on Jack, whereby uh, when it got to the end of Liam's career, you would assume that in, in this documentary he wouldn't have... Um, many nice things to say, I suppose, about the whole situation. And it's the last scene of the documentary. He whips out a letter and says, well, actually, Jack did write to me about how it ended. So have a listen. This is Liam uh, reading the letter. <laughs> and the whole TV audience went, oh, my God. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, Liam Brady, I, he was a god to me. And my best mate was a Arsenal fan and we watched Liam Brady on the terraces. And then one day on my second game for Ireland, I'm rooming with Liam Brady. I'm thinking, Jeez. we're playing Kaluki, a London card game together, me and Liam. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I know that sat badly with Jack. And, and and Liam took that, you know, like you would do it. You know, Liam was one of the greatest players of all time to play for Ireland. 
tremendous footballer, Liam. And, you know, done something incredible at a very young age in his early 20s to go to Italy, play like he did. Um, and, and and to be fair, Liam, Liam was... I can remember we played a friendly um, and Liam had come over. He was in the Juve team, came over, didn't need to be there at all, mm. came over, didn't want to miss the Ireland game. Mm. Didn't want to miss it at all. He was there all the time. To him playing for Ireland was as important plan for you as Juventus. But it showed the side of Jack as well that, like I said earlier, he can be incredibly sensitive. I've had it myself with Jack. Um, you were dropped in Italian. Yeah, he yeah. dropped me. He dropped me walking across a foyer in a uh, hotel, yeah. and he just said, uh, "You're out." Shouted it across the uh, across the foyer, and I went, "Sorry, Jack." He went, "You're out. You were useless against the Egyptians. You're not playing against the Dutch. You're not playing." And that was it. But I, you know, in the years afterwards, I I, I sort of got it because I. Jack, because he he has to make really ruthless decisions, he doesn't like it, and his only way of dealing with it is to be straight up front and get away from it, and it's done. He doesn't go into some you know fake dialogue of well you didn't do this in this game and this didn't yeah. go well, so I'm gonna. He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't like doing that. He's uncomfortable. And what he went straight for the jugular. I didn't like it. I was like Liam. I felt really. I was devastated that day. I've just lost my place in the group stages yeah. of the World Cup '90, and um, but it's his way. And I learned that over years. And so you didn't hold a grudge over that. No, I didn't because I always felt I'm going to prove Jack wrong. And look, Noel Quinn came in, played the game, scored the goal. I what what can I do and say uh, that is a wrong decision? It's not. It, it was a decision that he had to make. He felt he had to do it. And if you think you have to do something in life, you have to go with it. Mm. Whether you prove wrong or right afterwards. Um, so I, I get it with Jack. And I, I enjoy It's part of the reason why I'm I'm here really now today trying to say try and we'll put in process, which obviously Try Moon uh, Productions is to do something way more bigger. Uh, and get a lot of the stuff I've seen, witnessed, played. You know, I've been in punditry 23 years and I've played nearly 20. Mm. You know, so I've had a long time, four decades in the game. Uh, and I've met some incredible people. I've been very, very fortunate. And if someone said to me, I'm going again, I'd say, give me just the life I've had. Yeah. That's all I want. What I've, you know, what I've done with the downs and the ups, all I want is that again. Mm. So uh, it's been special. What was the best time of your career, the best time of your life? Um, well, well, I would say it's really weird you asked me that question because if you said to me career as in football, I would have said then Ireland being being a great you know side to play for and just that experience and you know I come through <laughs> Dublin Airport today and I'm, I've got one guy meeting me with a cab driver <laughs> to meet me in 1990. It was half a million people. Yeah. Uh, meeting, meeting me and the rest of the team and that was just extraordinary but I would say definitely professionally then I would say I'm the happiest I've been uh, personally because I've gone through um, some very difficult personal situations yeah. but I'm I'm as happy as I've been for a long time Are you? Because and uh I'm amazed at how open you are about your life, actually. As, as someone who would lean towards privacy, even amongst friends half the time, you're like this open book, reading various... I know, I do get told, I say too interviews much sometimes. ...interviews and podcasts, and obviously the book with Paul Kimmage all those years ago. Because um, in 2014, he interviewed you, and you were still, I suppose, overcoming a uh, divorce. To, yeah. Uh, uh, French woman called Virginia. Yeah. Who I think... Mm. Did you say she passed away during... Yeah, she passed away last January. Not... Uh, the, uh, uh, 2020 to uh, 22 in January okay. and I had three children with her and they lived in Tahiti yes and it come with enormous consequences that um, it's being resolved ne literally in the last few months and I'm seeing my my son Josh who I last saw at six who's now 16 um, it was a very turbulent finish to our relationship and um, and I and I took that really badly because not not it's like if you've got children and you've got, a, say, a six-year-old and you say, well, you're not going to see that six-year-old six for 10 years. So this summer, I'm seeing Josh the first time for 10 years. Um, and there was lots of obstacles and reasons why. Um, um, and I felt, I felt like my children were kidnapped from me. From me. Um, maybe that's a bit harsh, but they, they didn't see me. So, it, and it wasn't because of my lack of trying. 
it was because obstacles and living on the other side of the world in Tahiti mm. had its own problems and 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 that was a really difficult time and my my who I'm married to now Joe um we got married in 19 um but we'd been together since 2009 and the reason we didn't get married earlier was because I wasn't going to rush into it because yes. I needed understandably but also because I had baggage that I needed to sort out um and that was very, very tricky. And I'd, I'd read a book in, I think it was, was it 18 or was it the start of the pandemic? I think maybe the start of the pandemic when, um, by Jordan Peterson. Uh, and, and it was about, I'd, I'd realised that I'd lied too much in, in my life as well. And, and it, that was a changing moment for me. I thought, I'm going to try and live my next part of my life mm. without lying because one of his uh he has these 12 rules i think one of them is to yeah. al always tell the truth yeah exactly yeah. yeah and i read his book and i and there had been some like, like all problematic relationship there's lies in there and and i decided and i started to get open up before this about a lot of issues and then suddenly i was confronted with a pandemic and thinking I've got to do that. I've got to try that. Now, that's not saying, uh, you know, there's the, the silly lies, which uh, you do because oh, if it's someone's birthday, don't tell them we're having a private bar. You know, not um, just lies that don't make your life easier. And since I've been like that, I found myself in no trouble and I've not got myself into any situation where I know what I'm answering because it's the truth. Mm. <laughs> it's so, so much easier. Mm. And, and, and I decided at that time that I needed to seriously have a change of direction and um but i wanted joe to be along with me that was the big thing i wanted her to be along with me on this because i owed it to her she she'd gone through difficult times she'd had a gone into a coma in two um, when we had rocco our son who's seven uh she'd gone into a coma in 16 2016 um and it was touch and go for a while then that you know and her recovery was very slow um, luckily, if you saw today, you'd, you'd think she's nothing wrong okay. at all. Um, and she's, she's recovered. And life has become way better. Um, so, But unfortunately, some very sad scenarios because yeah. my three children don't have their mum as well. No, dreadful. Which is, which is a, you know, a terrible thing for everybody. I, like I would say any parent listening can't imagine not seeing their child for 10 years. Hmm. Like psychologically to cope with that day in, day out must have been horrific. Well, um, I feel like I'm welling up a bit now because yeah. the conversation is but it's one that i've had with a number of people and i've i've said that because people that you look at and you go oh, that's you know that's not nice that's been that must have been really horrible and you go yeah then i say to them right you see your little girl your little boy they go tomorrow and they're six and they go away and you now won't see them until they're 16. so what do you think you'd be like and there's like well how do you you can't you can't imagine that in therapy every day well i there was some really... I did go off the rails at times. I did. Yeah, I'll bet. I did. Uh, and you know, I just didn't didn't know how to solve anything because it got very complicated because my wife was... My wife was French, but I had to cross two sort of laws of, you know, what's the rights in France, and then she's moved to Tahiti because when she... I, I, let, I said I'd agree to her to go... As long as I can see the children, I, I, I agree that you can go to France, but I have to have visitation rights. But then France is a colony of... Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Tahiti is a colony of France. So now that's not... She would argue that is France because even that's a colony. I say, it's not France. Mainland France is not. Okay. It, you know, and so it, it became very complicated. Yeah. Well, that's going to be some reunion. How do you feel about it? I'm really looking forward to it because we've Zoomed and chatted and his English is good and his brother, William, who I, I've seen a lot more of, who's older... And um, we get on really well. And uh, if you saw him, you'd think it was me at nineteen. Um, and yeah, and so he's been he's sort of sort of put things together. And and Josh is really wanting to see me. Right. So that's the the obstacles already done right. because that to me was my biggest worry. Is if he went, well, I don't know if I want to see. Now that's that's an issue in itself. So, but. This is, uh, he's coming over, he arrives on the first week uh, of July in, in England. He's going to France for two weeks before, and then he's coming to England. So I'm really excited and nervous, very nervous. <laughs> Amazing. God, yeah. life stays interesting, doesn't it? Well, it does, it does. Um, but I mean, I'm in a really good place, so that's the most important thing. He's going to see his dad in a good place, which right. he wouldn't have seen, you know, in previous years. Um, 
I could talk to you all day, unfortunately. Our time is <laughs> I know, I, 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 I knew was, I'd um, go on too long. No. I didn't even intend to say too much, but I can't help it. Yeah, no, I, I, it's such a pity. I'd love <laughs> to talk to you for a while more, but I know you're, you're needed in, in other places. People can uh, watch your short feature yes. on uh, the Virgin Media Player, and I suspect they will do in their droves. Uh, Tony Cascarino, real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.